Welcome to the seventh ever Smoo Talks put on by our students here at Smoo. Our theme for tonight is Paradigm Shift, which refers to changing uh, your set of beliefs, the pattern, the pattern of thoughts you use to go through life, and in general, just the way you view the world around you. Tonight we'll have four student speakers, uh, and then we'll finish with a keynote speech from a Smoo alumni, uh, a Jay Freeze. Please silence your cell phones. You don't want to be that person who has the phone ring in the middle of the show. If you do need to go to the bathroom, it's in the big building to your left when you leave the chapel. Without further ado, please welcome your MCs for the night, Matthew and Sonia. Thank you for the introduction, Ewan. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Matthew, and this is my co-host, Sonia. Welcome everyone to Smoo Talks, and without any further ado, we would like you to sit back and start off with our first student speaker. Our first student speaker is Lauren Jung. Uh, he's a grade 12 boarder from Bolton House, and he is known as the magician of Smoo. Let's welcome him up to stage. that might not know me very well. Bad people. <gasps> this guy. He's not following the Asian prophecy? No. He's not going to become a doctor or a lawyer or accountant. I wonder what his parents said when he wanted to be a magician. What did his dad say when... i tell you what that said. That, that would be... What the hell you want to be the... The Harry Potter? <laughs> right, so when it comes to the word magic, right, people have different definitions and perspectives and, and, and some might induce this image of fiction stories and fairy tales. For me, at the age of 15, I had this obsession with understanding magic as a performance. I would look at magicians on TV, on the street, and I want to know exactly how they do the things to the finest, smallest details. Why? Because I want to understand the truth. So with me, truth had different definitions, and I had a weird relationship with this word, truth. You know exactly what's true to you, right? The world is round, trees are green, pizza is good. Right, um, but have you ever thought of if what you believe is true? Not I was obviously not aware because it's not scary. But what you think is <laughs> true is also the absolute truth. Meaning, would that true thing still apply in the future? Bear with me here. If a person is born, as an infant, he or she only knows a few things, right? The fears of hunger, the fear of around loud noises. And as you grow in the environment you're given in, you kind of just accept everything that's around you without questioning, like food, language, rules that you learn even without others telling you, just subconsciously. Like, if I take this coin, right, and I drop the coin from one hand to the other, other. But you know that once I let go of my hand, it'll drop with the acceleration of negative 9.8%. <laughs> but what if one day that you almost win is something that doesn't affect you? Like object permanence. You know that if I close my hand around the coin, the coin will still be there. It's still there. That's because you have object permanence. But what happens is that if before a child instead, if it, for a child, if the coin is just out of sight, and you believe that it's out of sight, it's also out of mind. Right? And by the lack of questions, I kind of see the lack of interest. But, um, so, but that doesn't just explain why, you know, we might lose our car keys. But something a little bit more beautiful, a little bit more interesting for me 
Um, during 11, I had the opportunity to uh, travel to Nicaragua, and I met this special person, S. P. J. Thing sound, but um, his name is Tomas. Now, as a magician myself, there's always a battle between the performer and the spectator. You want to know exactly how I'm doing that. And but some of you are going, uh, no, Mr. Magician, I just want to believe in magic. And I call those people liars. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know how I'm doing it. But does that mean you always have to question everything you don't understand? Because for Tomas, he didn't question. Instead, he was able to almost accept it and learn from it and see the creative stuff. Because a coin doesn't fall off, it doesn't disappear. If you show him that something might disappear, he'll appreciate it and learn something new from it. You might not in an instant. If you look back, maybe you'll see it as something as what I call it. Um, a gift. What is it? If you receive a gift, you don't reject the gift. Even if you don't like the gift, you don't question the gift, neither the person who gave you the gift. Even if you don't use the gift, you keep it. And this became for me and for him almost a gift. Of a moment. <laughs> um, because if you see the moment of magic as a gift, instead of questioning it, you appreciate it. Like, like how you would see a rainbow. <laughs> right? Rainbow. A rainbow is not real. They're in the air. The illusion of a rainbow is real. Does that mean? You walk towards the rainbow in maybe a different direction. All of a sudden, the rainbow slowly disappears. But somebody else might be seeing the rainbow on the other side. The rainbow is an image. But nobody questions the rainbow. That's a rainbow. It's a fake rainbow. Nobody say that. If you look at the rainbow, you go, I live in a world where there are beautiful rainbows. <laughs> but that doesn't just mean that you shouldn't just not question everything and just not and just believe in it, what other people say. Like if somebody told you that there was a pot of gold on the other side of the rainbow, you will question. Like, no, there's no gold on the other side of the rainbow. But if it comes from a genuine heart, you're able to assess the information you're given. And even if it's not real, even if it's something you don't want to understand. Accept it. Because along the way, you might see something a lot more beautiful. I'm going to demonstrate it with a penguin hair. I'm going to throw it behind my back. Who catches it? And if you don't want to watch it, just throw something else. But if you do, uh, I'd like you to come out with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please welcome Sonia. Give her a round of applause. No, actually. Mm -hmm. Just 
in your head, you, you take your time, but whenever you're ready, when that number comes to you, yell at all else that everybody in there. Yeah. Four. 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 <laughs> you take that penguin, it's third to somebody else who wants one more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joel, uh, you can stay where you're at. But there are four suits in a deck, right? There are the hearts, clubs, the spades, and the diamonds, right? Again, same thing. Whenever a suit comes to your mind, take your time. Yeah, I'll ask everybody to pick me. The, the four suits, hearts, clubs, spades, and diamonds. Spades? So, what did you say was the four? There's the four and the spades. Spades. <laughs> um, can I touch that deck since I. No. Yeah. No, right? And no, there's nothing happened. There's nothing happened. But. Oh my God. Me? <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's do this. You can see it as a coincidence, maybe, but also something good. Just, although nothing seemed to happen, uh, you guys get this. Um, oh my god! Oh, never mind. No. <laughs> Thank you. Once more. 
as I faced things that I really had to do, like figure out what flights I was going to be on or decide which of my many, many clothes would make the cut and come with me, I found I could do things again. It wasn't as hard as it had been before. And as my brain started to shift, that positivity came back into my life and I began to trust in myself once more. As I was writing the speech, I became fascinated with how I could undergo such an intense shift in such a short amount of time, seemingly because of circumstances outside of my control. In doing a little research, I came across the concept of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity describes the ability of our brain to change the connections between neurons. When we're exposed to new stimulus or developments in our lives, these neural pathways change or disappear altogether. The new experience of preparing to leave home allowed my brain a chance to rewire itself, and it gave me the opportunity I needed to find a new way to move through my world. This shift towards a more positive mindset didn't stop once I got to France. Being in a new place gave me a new sense of purpose. I began to approach life not just as a series of things that had to be done, but instead of something worth doing. And I found I could do all sorts of things. When my house parents asked me to help cook dinner, or I had to go speak to my teachers in a language I barely knew, or I got lost in the old town without my phone and had to walk home in the drenching rain, I found I could do all those things. And I could also write bad essays on Moliere in my classes and learn about the eight classifications of French workers and train my brownie recipe for a perfect ratatouille recipe for my house parents. And everything started to feel just a little bit better. I applied to SMU in the weeks leading up to my departure, and at the time, I felt apprehensive. I was scared. What if I wasn't good enough? What if I never got that motivation back? What if I couldn't succeed here? But when I got my acceptance letter in March, while I was still far away from home, I realized that I didn't need to feel scared. I could let myself feel happy. I could let myself be excited for this new opportunity that was coming into my life. Because now I knew how to fix that lack of motivation, that hopelessness within my brain. Change. Everyone will go through a period in their lives where they feel unmotivated, they feel dejected, they feel hopeless. Whether the source of this low is internal or external, clear or unclear, it can feel impossible to just get over it and move on with your life. But maybe the secret to moving past this kind of obstacle is to see it as a signal that wherever you are now isn't enough for you. Our environment shapes our brains, and it shapes us perhaps more than we know. So maybe next time you're looking for a change within yourself, it's worth looking for that change from the outside in. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa, for the speech. Um, it's now time for a 10 minute intermission. Um, there are refreshments in the back corner over there. And you can use this time to connect with speakers and as well as you will enjoy other, um, music performance by Mark and Moore and Jordan Hallowell. And there are also artworks from the grade nine class around the chapel, so you can look at them as well.
searching for how I am calling In all the good times I find myself longing for change In all the bad times I feel myself Change your plans, tell a train to change your mind. 
maybe it's time to let the old ways die. Oh, maybe it's time to let the old ways die. Thank you, Mark and Georgia, for that impressive performance. Um, welcome to the second half of our event. And so now we will have Alan Iturriaga, who is a very loved boarder from Bolton House. And uh, he will be telling us about his understandings of religion in the world and in his own life. Please welcome up Alan. So my mother once told me, la verdad no será libres. She said it was a moral or pro alma matter. And in Spanish it means, the truth shall set you free. Now, I would later learn that although it would set me free, the truth would not make me happy. You see, my family is religious, and it wouldn't be anything unusual given that around 83% of the population in Mexico self-identifies as Catholic. So my religious upbringing is not something that I resent, quite the contrary, I cherish it. My grandfather built a chapel in his backyard, and whenever there was a cause for a celebration, my grandparents would host a mass. So, whenever my grandfather speaks about the chapel, he has this little twinkle in his eyes, and he tells about how he accomplished everything to make the place perfect. One day, I was reading a history book that my parents had bought me, and I was flipping through the pages, looking for pictures, and you're 10 years old, and I stumbled upon one of a painting. There were these men in religious attire, and they had, they had these distinct red robes. They had these golden crosses hanging from their necks, and they seemed to be burning people. The title read, The Spanish Inquisition, and my mind raised in horror and curiosity. Like, what could this be? I remember the shocked look in my friend's face when I asked them about it, but no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> So, I couldn't believe this was happening. Like, what was this? So I kept reading my history book, looking for hints of my religion in between the complicated mess that is our history. And what I stumbled with was less than pleasant. See, religion was not what I thought it was. It wasn't only Spanish Inquisition, but it was a violent indoctrination of American natives. And it was a countless of records of execution by heresy. Galileo Galilei himself was put to trial because of his works in astronomy and physics. I would also later learn that this violence is not exclusive to my religion. You see, the famed philosopher Socrates, who lived in Athens long before Jesus was even born, was charged and executed on charges of atheism and poisoning the youth, or that meant a nation race. This realization that violence is not exclusive to my religion, or rather a pattern in organized religion, changed me, and it made me, it made, it made me question my faith. So in grade nine, I started questioning my faith not only ethically and historically, but also theologically. Was the stuff that were teaching me actually true? So I watched countless hours of religious debate. I became familiar with the most prominent critics of religion, like Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens. I remember when Hitchens first opened his speech, ladies and gentlemen, friends, brothers and sisters, comrades. It was very romantic, and by grade 10, I could tell you about the Logical inconsistencies in the theory of intelligent society accounts in the Bible that were historically inaccurate. So I changed a lot. First, my belief was brought to the ground and, and then revealed in a relatively short period of time. And I was capable to my belief. But you see, the thing about atheism is that it's a double edged sword, but it is liberating its implications about who we are, where we come from, and how we should behave. I mean, terrifying. It was say that was a bit of an existential crisis. And I noticed a change when I went back to Mexico that summer during grade 10. Whenever someone brought religion up, I would hopelessly cringe. And whenever I said to do my reference chapel, or any other church for that matter, places that I purely felt so sacred. And I had an eerie feeling to them. Praying seemed annoying, and to be frank, all the absurd. So I became concerned with my family, my beliefs, and myself. Yet, I started to appreciate religion again. It was a gradual change, but I can pinpoint the moment where I became conscious of it. It was a particularly bad night, a particularly bad week, of a particularly bad year. I'd gone downtown with a couple of friends, and they wanted to have dinner. And me, not wanting to spend an exorbitant amount of money in an outrageously expensive restaurant that I had settled with, I awkwardly excused myself and began wandering down the streets of downtown Victoria. 
Because it was Victoria, it started raining, and then I noticed that A, I didn't have an umbrella, B, I didn't have a coat, and C, I didn't have a phone. So there I was, walking down the streets of downtown Victoria, and I stumbled upon a cathedral. I looked at it, and I saw these soft yellow hue kind of seeping out through the cracks of the old wooden doors. And I was hesitant, but I was desperate from the roof, so I entered. As I entered the main chamber, I got the feeling in the back of my neck. There's a feeling that I always got when I stepped into church. It was a feeling that told me that I did not belong there. I, I considered leaving, but then something cut the corner of my eye. You see, there was a couple all the way to the front, and they were sitting down quietly praying. There was something about knowing that I wasn't alone that made me stay. So I sat on the bench, and I started looking upwards. I always loved cathedrals for their architecture. There's a great feeling in knowing that people had built something so beautiful and intricate. I settled down into my seat, and I began to reflect on how the afternoon had gone, and a deep feeling of loneliness inundated me. My eyes looked skywards once more, and as I was falling in a maze of arches, my mind began to wander off. What did the cathedral stand for? I questioned myself. The answer is pretty simple. It stood for a god. A god that, in my eyes, was unjust. A god that had been corrupted by its people for its power, and the power had set the world on fire time and time again. But no, that was what the institution stood for. What did this cathedral stand for? Why had the people of this community killed this place and then? I thought the couple was sitting all the way to the front. I thought maybe one day with their vows they would celebrate one of the happiest days of their life. And maybe later, they would have a child, and they would come here and celebrate a new life with their family. I thought of this chapel, and how important it is to the people of this community, and finally, I thought of my grandfather's chapel, and what an important unifier it had been for my family in times of hardship. In that moment, I felt nothing but fascination of how remarkable it was for a group of people, united by an age-old story, to come together and feel joy. The phrase, God is dead, is not a celebratory statement. You see, when philosopher and writer Friedrich Nietzsche coined the term, he was warning us about the complex psychological dangers that the end of faith would bring. Now, he was not human religion if he passed, but he loathed, the, he loathed the, the, the Christian mindset, but he was worried of its decline. Myself, like Nietzsche, I'm not a believer, but I cherish the way religion brings people together. Author John Green puts some better words. We historically have created so many celebration rituals, from coming to age ceremonies to yay it rained ceremonies, to come together and feel joy. But it seems nowadays that we don't do that anymore. I'm still frustrated with religion, and I will actively criticize it as long as it doesn't make some radical changes to its dogma. But whenever I'm walking down to the chapel with my grandfather, I will only think of how it has brought my family together time and time again. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. That was really insightful. Continuing on the theme of religion, we have our next speaker, Nadris Al Zali. She's a grade 12 boarder from Oman in Winslow House. She's going to be talking about uh, seeking out truths about uh, religion and uh, the world around us rather than accepting um, the news of society. Let's give it up for now. Just I don't need to be rude, but why aren't you wearing your thing today? This is for you. So when scientists wanted to draw the structure of the benzene ring, they were unsure about the placements of the bonds. They could not investigate where the double bonds actually existed, and so they had multiple structures for the benzene molecule. But eventually, they came up with a unified structure that combined all those possible structures into one. And this is called the resonance of the benzene ring. Now, the spectrum of beliefs I held as a child was shaped by my surroundings. I never really had any control over my view of the world. 
Every night my mom would read me bedtime stories from the Quran until I carved them into my heart. I loved reading about them, mainly because my view of the world was feeding off of them. The values I carried with me were predetermined by the geographical location in which I was born. I had to do certain things at certain times in certain ways. Every time doubt seeped into my mind, I was drowned by the fear of insulting the one thing I held on to the most, God. I always felt like I was living in a fog. My only guide was the silver threat to heaven I was instructed to follow. But as I grew older, I felt a strong connection to God. But a feeling of guilt always haunted me as I found it hard to convince myself to pray five times a day. One night, my brother showed me a video of a boy reciting the Quran so beautifully. His voice drowned me with a strange feeling of insecurity that I've never felt. I woke up the next day suddenly determined to grow my faith in God, but I did not know where to start. I tried everything for weeks. I taught myself how to love God. I taught myself how to pray meticulously five times a day with every single detail taken into account and recite the Quran for hours. I integrated his name into every conversation I made. I begged and I cried and begged him to show me the way. I even ended up changing my denomination from a body to Sunni because I thought that was the right thing to do, but I did not tell my parents. Every step I took, though, was disguised by a temporary feeling of comfort that soon turned into doubt. I started wondering to myself, what if I'm not following the right denomination? What if I'm following the wrong religion? What if I'm looking for something that's not really there? I was 14 when God became everything in my life, yet something still felt missing. It was the need to believe in God on my own without any cultural subjective predispositions. I knew that I had to reset my mind, chart the uncharted territories, and dare to question the unquestionable. I always knew, though, it would lead me back to God because unbelief was not a, an, a, realist, a realistic option to me. I wanted to go to heaven and tell God that I chose him out of all the thousands of gods out there. I never realized how fragile that silver thread to heaven was. I never realized that letting go of that silver thread would leave me faithless. I spent so many nights crying, scrolling through the internet, cramming books about religion, looking for that one bit of information that would lead me back to God. I found no escape from the millions of questions rooming around my head. It was like a mental war in which I never agreed to participate. I felt betrayed as if my whole idea of the world had fallen apart. But rewiring my brain was not as challenging as handling the uncertainty that followed it. I jumped from the helicopter of faith to my freedom. But the feeling of security I thought I would carry with me vanished as soon as I realized I had no parachute. I found no escape again from the millions of questions rooming around my head. But um, after traveling to Canada on my own, I found people whose thoughts and values resonated with mine as opposed to those of my family, friends, and teachers back home. I started becoming two different individuals who behave in different ways, speak in different languages, and even wear different clothes, which confuses people all the time. But trust me, it confuses no one more than it does to me. I. Just like the resonance of the Benzene Wing, I let those conflicting worlds to coexist within me, even though it was really challenging. And I realized how much that experience has deeply affected me. It made me critical of everything, including science. It was like I was setting up a table my whole life and then suddenly having, having to pull out the tablecloth and start from scratch. At that moment, I realized that I had to establish my own sets of values but I did not know where to start. I started wondering about things that I never had to think about, mainly because they were all predetermined for me, like the original ideas behind premarital sex, marriage, monogamy, and polyamory on their own field. I started reading a lot of philosophical books about human rights, sacrifice, altruism, and morality. I felt so powerful having 
Basically, external acting is, is kind of playing your body like an instrument. You're, you're controlling the different muscles in your body to have new movements. You're controlling the muscles in your face to give off different expressions. You're changing the tone and the volume of your voice. All in the, uh, the effort to kind of give off the effect that you are experiencing certain emotions as the character. Internal acting, um, a common method is called method acting, which you've probably heard of. But internal acting is where you're actually trying to Make yourself experience the emotions of the character, and, 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 and once you do that, you know, your body will probably naturally react, and your muscles in your face will naturally form expressions, and, and you'll naturally change the tone of your voice and everything to give off the, the 
you know, honest appearance that you're feeling these emotions. And so I remember in grade seven in Oliver, um, standing on stage and I was trying to cry. And how I was doing this is I was standing there with my eyes open and I wouldn't blink. And I just wouldn't blink until my eyes began to water and that's how I cried. And so that's an example of external acting. Um, however, in recent years, I've, I've, I've turned to internal acting um, as, a, as a method to prepare for and uh, you know, enact my performances. And um, for example, uh, last year I was being tested for this TV show called Deadly Class, which just came out on Sci-Fi Network. Um, and, I, and I was going to meetings in New York and, and Vancouver auditioning for this role of the homeless teenager, Marcus, and I would walk the streets of the downtown Vancouver East Side for hours, uh, not just observing the homeless population, but trying to imagine for an hour straight that this was my reality and this is how I was living day to day. Um, another example of my style of acting was uh, I had a role where my character had a deep experience where he battled this fear of heights. And so I, like a lot of people, do have a slight fear of heights. So one night at home, um, I willed myself to jump off the highest balcony of my house to a soft-ish surface 15 feet below. And uh, the whole process was a lot harder than I thought. It took me 45 minutes just to, just to talk myself into doing it. Um, another example is I was playing this, this role in a movie where um, my friend and I were, or the character's friend and I were walking into this scary house at night and we didn't know what was expected. And so to prepare, I, I went on walks at night uh, with my dog for protection. And um, I would, I would kind of get myself spooked by, by exploring new areas, you know, um, with real risk and, and real unknown so that I could observe how it made me feel and I could recreate that feeling uh, while on set, surrounded by cameras and a crew, and no real danger whatsoever. Um, and when I can't, sorry, when I can't physically, thank you. Thank you. So when I can't physically um, recreate situations uh, for a role, I have to, you know, use my imagination to to imagine living different lives, because that's what acting is all about. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's really wonderful uh, consequences to this style of acting. You can get a heightened sense of empathy and a greater understanding for other people's lives and for yourself. But whatever this muscle is inside your brain, which allows you to turn off your own thoughts and feelings temporarily and turn on the thoughts and feelings of another character, um, this can be incredibly disorienting because you start having the thoughts of other characters and it can be hard to discern which thoughts are authentically yours and which thoughts are not. And uh, acting is not generally thought of as a dangerous profession, but uh, certain cases prove otherwise. So this is a very famous actor named Heath Ledger, who I'm sure many of you have heard of. And Heath uh, specialized in internal acting, right? He was, a, he was a method actor and he would really like to get into the mind of his, of his characters, try to understand them. But there are some characters, which some people would argue, that we shouldn't attempt to understand the mind of. And at the top of that list is probably the Joker. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Joker is uh, um, the worst of all supervillains. He basically represents pure evil and a lack of, of empathy and thought for, you know, other others. And so you can just imagine for most people, the thought process for getting into the mind of this character could be very difficult and uh, very uncomfortable. And so Heath, um, in preparation for the role, isolated himself in a room for a month, studying studying the role and, and reading the comics of, of Batman and, and basically trying to embody this role. And then afterwards, he, um, he, his, he said his mind was always turned with thoughts, and, and, and he, couldn't, he couldn't shut them off, and it gave him an incredible insomnia, and so he was prescribed medication to help his insomnia, and unfortunately, um, several months before The Dark Knight, which is this, what this, this picture is from, the movie was even released, he actually accidentally died of an overdose of his prescription medication, and some, uh, some people and some people close to him believe that it was 
his deep dive into this role, which caused his mind to be turned so much that he required these medications. And it's not just Heath Ledger. Uh, just in last week's paper, I was, I was, I was looking over it. Actually, I was, I, as I was writing the speech, I was walking in the bathroom in a cafe I was at, and, and I, this article caught my eye. Michael B. Jordan searching, uh, seeking therapy after, after um, performing the main villain in Black Panther. Uh, he said that in order to conjure up kind of the nastiness of the role, he felt like he needed to isolate himself, and he felt like he needed to become so lonely, and that after the role was done, it had impacted him deeply that he, he wasn't ready to accept the, the love that was there for him by his friends and family, and, and he wanted to stay in this lonely place for as long as possible. So obviously this has been um, a concern for acting for, for many years. So in 2015, this institute in Australia does this study, right? It's the biggest study ever done on actors' well-being. And uh, they published their 60-page report on the mental health of different actors and actresses. And um, they come up with the statistics that there's an alarmingly high rate of anxiety and stress in actors, and that actors and actresses experience depression at twice the usual rate of a regular person. So, you know, um, there's a lot of things that could be contributing to this, and people are wondering, um, you know, is it, is it the lifestyle, the, the, the pressures of fame and media attention, is it drugs and alcohol? And while all these things obviously do play a large role in, in different people's lives, uh, perhaps one of the biggest factors in these statistics is what actors and actresses actually do as their job and how, how stepping into the minds of other people can be incredibly confusing uh, when you're looking at your own identity. And so, sorry, there we go. Um, and so, I grew up incredibly fortunate here in Victoria. I, I, I had a very lucky life, I still do. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to go here to Smooth, here at Smooth, but also, um, I, I never really, growing up I never really encountered deep sadness or deep loss. I never, I never felt betrayed really. And as a result of this, I never really accessed parts of my mind uh, that if I had grown up another way, I may have had to access. So I never accessed parts of my mind that controlled, you know, like rage or, or revenge or jealousy. And, and as I started taking acting more seriously in the past few years, and I really started to go deep into roles to try to get the most honest, honest portrayal of the character, I, I realized that a lot of roles aren't like that. A lot of roles, you know, um, the characters have, have, have experiences that fundamentally change them and they, they have um, very troubled, troubled lives. And so I, I couldn't first time relate. And so I needed to go to parts of my brain that I had never been to before. You know, I, I, um, my agent has a quote. He says, uh, acting can cause you to access corners of your mind that may otherwise never see the light of day. And so I started to, to do this, and I started to, to walk around my brain farther than I had ever been, and I, and I kind of realized that my whole life growing up, I had just walked around in a tiny part of my brain, and I thought it was my whole brain, but it wasn't. I realized I could go way farther that way, way farther that way. I was defined by my own experiences, but I was playing the roles of characters who had incredibly different experiences, so I had to go to different parts of my brain. And I kind of realized that I, the J, was capable of thinking in a lot of different ways, a lot of ways that I had never, you know, thought of before. And although normally I play a lot of innocent and sweet characters, I also knew that in the future I may have to play uh, an incredibly wide array of characters. And, and what would I do then when I had to play? Uh, bizarre character, or an evil character, or a horrifying character, where would I go in my brain then? And so, I wondered, would I even be able to play these characters? And so I started kind of testing out my head, and I started thinking, I started to explore the capabilities of my own mind. So I was thinking how far I could go one way, how far I could go another way, 
And I kind of concluded that I could think in any way. And this really, really upset me and really scared me. I felt like I had kind of lost my own identity in a sense. You know, if I can if I can think in any way, if I can have all these thoughts of all these different characters, then who am I? So my agent was right. I was accessing corners of my brain that I had never accessed before. And um, sometimes I would encounter things that horrified me, or things that were completely bizarre, or things that made no sense to me. And did that mean that I was horrifying, that I was bizarre, that I didn't make any sense? I think we tend to believe that we are what we think, you know, but if acting has taught me one thing, it's that this isn't true at all. Our minds are literally capable of thinking anything. For example, these are two posters that are on the wall of my apartment in Vancouver. And these are the two plays I did at, at SMU, which I'm incredibly proud of. But Oliver is an incredibly sweet, innocent, caring boy. And the Phantom is this, is this narcissistic, selfish villain. And I realized I've, I've inhabited both of these characters I can have thoughts of either of these characters, and, and the brain is so powerful, and the brain can have any, any thoughts you want. We can all do it right now. We can all conjure up any thought, completely positive, completely negative. That doesn't mean we are those thoughts. How our hearts respond to these thoughts actually tells us much, much more about who we are than having these thoughts in the first place. So, a lot of you are going out in the world now, and you know a lot of you aren't actors, and maybe some of you are, and a lot of you have tried acting, and a lot of you will never try acting. But you are going to be going out in the world, and you're going to be encountering, you know, very different people, um, likely even in environments you never knew existed, and you're going to be encountering people with experiences that you know, you never imagined, and you're going to be thrown all this new information, and you're going to be experiencing all these new things.